Are you disappointed? Are you desperate for help? You know what it's like to be tired and only a shell of yourself. Well, you start to believe you don't have what it takes. Cause it's all you can do just to move, much less finish the race. But don't forget what lies ahead. Almost home, brother, it won't be long. Soon all your burdens will be gone. With all your strength, sister, run wild. But we win in the end Simply because of Jesus in us It's not if, but when So take joy in the journey Even when it feels long Oh, find strength in each step Knowing heaven is cheering you on Cause, brother, when for the Enterprise Baptist Association. And we are so blessed to be receiving that um, for the branch and um, are so thankful for that. Now, Miss Annie Allen, um, I believe we showed a video last week, um, talked a little bit about her, and I had told you before that I'd share a little more of, of her story. Um, but she was part of the WMU, 
And um, a lot of her ministry started uh, with, with children and with mothers. And um, she would have mothers clubs throughout the week um, that eventually turned into WMU groups. And uh, then with the children, she would start with the sunbeams and, and the, the RAs and the GAs. And um, anybody remember what those are? <laughs> okay. The Royal Ambassadors and the Girls in Action and, and, and those mission uh, efforts there. Um, but in 1927, Miss Annie learned about Vacation Bible School. And boy, she was so excited to be able to get that started um, in the places that she ministered to. And, and she did. She got the, the information and began preparation for those VBSs. And, and um, she was conducted over 200 vacation Bible schools here in the mountains during her ministry. Just an amazing lady. Um, so thousands of, of children came to know the Lord through that ministry of hers um, that she did. And, of course, we know that Vacation Bible School is still an effective evangelism tool for kids, but not even just for kids, but it helps get um, the adults, the parents, and it's just such a, a great outreach, um, which at the branch is what we want to do is minister to the whole family. And um, we want to... There's an addition that we want to, to build on to the building, which will allow us to have uh, bathrooms and four classrooms, um, including a nursery, uh, which will allow us to adequately minister to the whole family. Um, and this Annie Allen offering will, will be able to help towards that. So we ask you to, to pray about how God would have you help in that manner um, on the last Sunday of this month. So thank you. I heard an old, old story How a Savior came from glory How He gave His life on Calvary To save a wretch like me I heard about His groaning Of His precious blood atoning Then I repented of my sins and won the victory oh victory in jesus my savior forever he sought me and he bought me with his redeeming blood he loved me ere i knew him and all my love me to victory beneath the cleansing flood. Well, I heard about his healing, of his cleansing power revealing, how he made the lame to walk again and caused the blind to see. And then I cried, dear Jesus, come and heal my broken spirit. And somehow Jesus came and brought to me the victory. Oh, victory in Jesus, my Savior forever. He sought me and he bought me. With his redeeming blood, he loved me ere I knew him, and all my love is due him. He plunged me to victory beneath the cleansing blood. Oh, just hold the one, hold that one. You know, we can, we can either just stand here or we can worship the Lord. Now, which one would you rather do? You want to just stand here? Or do you want to worship the Lord? I think we need to thank Him, church. Amen. So, hey, come on. Clap your hands. Can you clap? Yeah. 
You know, clapping is worship. Dancing is worship. Singing is worship. Praying is worship. A good word for the Lord is worship. A smile to somebody is worship. Yeah, I can even see people smiling behind their mask. How about that? So let's worship the Lord. You know how to sing? Let's sing this. I'm happy. I heard about a mansion. He is built for me in glory. And I heard about the streets of gold beyond the crystal sea. About the angels singing and clapping and the old redemption story. And some sweet day I'll sing up there the song of victory. Sing it, church. Oh, victory in Jesus, my Savior forever. Well, he sought me and he bought me with his redeeming blood. He loved me ere I knew him and all my love. me to victory beneath the cleansing flood. Let's sing that again. Oh, victory in Jesus, my Savior forever. He sought me and he bought me with his redeeming blood. me to victory beneath the cleansing flood. Victory this morning.
and to reconcile the lost to redeem the whole creation you did not despise the cross for even in your suffering you saw to the other side knowing this was our salvation Jesus for our sake you died but he didn't stay dead oh praise the Father praise the Son praise the Spirit three in one he is the God of glory most important point in time and the morning that you rose all of heaven held its breath till the stone was moved for good for the lamb had conquered death and the dead rose from their tombs and the angels stood in awe for the souls of all who come to the Father are restored by His blood and in His name in His freedom we are free for the love of Jesus Christ who has resurrected me and the church of Christ was born then the Spirit lit the flame now this gospel truth of old shall not kneel shall not faint praise him church oh praise the father praise the son praise the spirit three in one he is the god of glory We need to do that again. Do you have anything to praise the Lord for this morning? Do you have anyone to praise the Lord for this morning? Put the chorus up there, Doug. Praise the Father. Praise the Son. Sing praise. Praise the Spirit, three in one. O oh, God of glory, majesty, praise forever to the King of kings. In heaven it will be praise forever the King of Kings. Praise His name. And church, don't forget that in the midst of all of this, all these things going on in the world, they're going to continue to go on. If we believe the Bible, they're going to get worse until it gets better. And you know when it's going to get better, right? When the Lord comes again. Well, uh, we're continuing in our series of sermons from 1 Peter. And today, preaching to myself. And you say, what does that mean? You'll find out in just a minute. So, but first want to remind you that we are in the ser middle of a series of sermons, actually toward the end of it, uh, entitled Serious Church. Uh, that's because Peter wrote this under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. And he said to us in chapter 5 uh, that we're moving into today in verse 8, 
uh, be of sober spirit, that means be serious. Uh, be on the alert. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. Uh, that is under inspiration of the Holy Spirit, the words of God. Amen. And so it's not playing around. It's not hyperbole for you English teachers. It is just plain fact. Satan wishes to destroy you and he will if you let him. But if you let Jesus into your heart and life, greater is he that is in us than he that is in the world. Amen. Right? And so you don't have to worry about that as long as you walk with him and you're serious and you're alert. Alert means, serious is sober spirit, but alert means your, your eyes are up, you're looking around, you're recognizing God's work, you're recognizing Satan's work, and you're making sure you're on the right side, right? So, that's the series of sermons that we're in. Today we're going to go into chapter 5, the first five verses, if you can and will stand with me in honor of God's word. He says, therefore... I exhort the elders among you as your fellow elder and witness of the sufferings of Christ and a partaker also of the glory that is to be revealed, shepherd the flock of God among you, exercising oversight, not under compulsion, but voluntarily, according to the will of God, and not for sordid gain, but with eagerness, nor yet as lording it over those allotted to your charge, but proving to be examples to the flock. And when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the unfading crown of glory. You younger men likewise be subject to your elders, and all of you clothe yourself with humility toward one another, for God is opposed to the proud, but gives grace to the humble. May the Lord add his blessing to the reading of his word. You may be seated today. Uh, many would take this passage to mean there is another biblical office called elder. Uh, that's uh, just not what this passage is teaching. It should not be taken this way. In one paragraph here that we read, Peter obviously uses different names to describe the same office. And that is the office of the pastor of a church. The God called minister of the gospel who is the pastor of a church. In the New Testament, the terms bishop, elder, and pastor are used interchangeably. As a matter of fact, here Peter uses them interchangeably in one paragraph. Uh, in, in verse 1, he uses the term elder. In the Greek, it's uh, presbuteros, uh, and you hear presbytery. Uh, that's, we get that word from that Greek word. The word means a senior leader. That's what that means, a senior leader. And here he's referring to the fact that a pastor of a church is a senior leader of that church. In verse 2, he uses the idea of pastor uh, or shepherd. The Greek word is poimaino, is what, is what he uses. It comes from poimain, which means shepherd or pastor. It's translated two different ways. It's translated shepherd when it's talking about a shepherd. It's talk, translated pastor when it's talking about a pastor of a, of a church and kind of interchangeably. Here it's, it's used in the verb form so it's translated shepherd. Do the work of a shepherd in other words. Uh, and of course once again uh, this is the act uh, uh, of feeding it comes from uh, the shepherd, a chief job of the shepherd is to get the flock to the field to, to eat the grass. <laughs> and that, that's uh, feeding. But he's referring to the same person. He's talking about the same person here as you can see. Also in verse 2, he says give oversight. Uh, that word is epi, uh, episkeo, episcopo uh, is, another, is a noun version and, and it's where we get the word bishop. And, uh, and so he's actually saying, and in some versions they'll translate it bishop here. But he's talking about the same person. So he uses, uses the term pastor. He, he uses uh, the term uh, 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 elder. He uses the term bishop. And he's talking about the same people. So obviously there's no new office uh, taught here. It is simply talking about the same person. Now this is important for you to know because 
what, uh, to recognize what's being said in this passage. And what we're saying in this series of sermons about being a serious church, Peter is now going to speak to the role of a pastor in a serious church. Now there are a lot of churches that play around and don't view their pastor and treat their pastor differently or the pastor thinks differently than what the scripture says his job is. That's not being serious about the word of God. If you want to be a serious church, you need a serious pastor who's doing seriously what the scripture says he's supposed to do. So, preaching to myself. But so I won't feel alone today. You don't want me to feel alone, do you? So, we have some other called to the gospel ministry guys here. So, This also is instructions to Brother Granger. Where are you, Brother Paul? There he is over there. It's also instructions to Brother Bobby. Hi, Bobby. And it's instructions to you, Josh, because you're getting ready to be ordained soon and be a pastor. And so uh, you all need to listen up. Now you say, can the rest of us shut it down now and sleep? Uh, I mean, Jack said he's tired anyway. So, no, because you all need, the church, the serious church needs to know what does the scripture require of a pastor, right? Not culture, right? Not somebody's opinion, but what the scripture says. So preaching to myself. Well, first of all, the first thing he says that this role of pastor of a church should be, it should be that you should be shepherding or pastoring You could translate either one, the flock. Shepherd the flock of God among you, he says. Now, as I've already pointed out, the word, you know, shepherd, pastor is one and the same in the original language. So the role of the shepherd is to follow, and you saw that in the reading, the command of the chief shepherd, right? Because he says later, when the chief shepherd comes, (laughs) you know, you're going to have to give an account. The New Testament is very plain. Just like prophets of the Old Testament were not accountable to the people of Israel or or Judah or Israel when they were split, they were accountable to God to say, Thus saith the Lord, and they were responsible to be 100% correct in what they said. And the only way you can be 100% correct in what you say is if you are 100% saying only what God says because God is never wrong. And a pastor today, if in feeding the flock, must be 100% correct in what he says in preaching, not my opinions about Kentucky basketball shared in the office over there. Those are not worth a dime. But, <laughs> but when I'm speaking or teaching God's word, I have to be 100% correct And therefore, if I'm not sure that's what this says, I don't say it. And from the day I was 12 years old and called to this day, I have sought to be 100% right on that. And I say that with confidence. Not that I've been 100% right in my life. (laughs) Nobody can say that, right? But when I stand up in the pulpit... As far as I know, so help me God, I've never said anything other than the word of God. That's why you won't hear me taking a a, a title of a sermon and going out there talking about my opinion. But as with everything else, even when I'm preaching to myself today, it will be straight from here. Because you see, we have to give an account to the chief shepherd, or you could say it, the owner of the flock. You see, shepherds don't own the flock. They just take care of it as responsibility to the chief shepherd or owner. And so, what does it mean? I I want to go and let you hear what Jesus had to say in John 10 about a shepherd. So Jesus said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, I am the door of the sheep. All who came before me are thieves and robbers. But the sheep did not hear them. I am the door. If anyone enters through me, he will be saved and will go in and out and find pasture. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I came that they may have life 
and have it abundantly. There, uh, this order from the chief shepherd to the shepherd is twofold. One is to protect the sheep from ravenous wolves who would steal, kill, and destroy. And I'll do that for you if I can. Two is to lead them. Lead them in order to feed them. The shepherd's job is not to decide what's going to happen at the market, how they're going to sell the wool, uh, you know, all those type of things. No, that's the chief shepherd's job, to set the direction, to set the purpose. It is simply the shepherd's job to take them to places where they may be fed. And what is the feed? The chief shepherd has already told me. It's this. To feed you the word of God. To lead the church to provide for you opportunities in small groups, on the internet, here at church. To dig into God's word and to feed from God's word. He next says that the shepherd should exercise oversight. Uh, he says it this way, the latter part of verse 2 and verse 3. Exercising oversight, but not under compulsion, but voluntarily according to the will of God. And not for sordid gain, but with eagerness. Not yet as lording it over those allotted to your charge, but proving to be examples to the flock. As we've already said, the word here is oftentimes translated bishop, that that's where we get the word bishop from the Greek language, this word that he uses here. Oversight. <clears throat> I want you to show, uh, show you another place where he's talking to a young minister in 1 Timothy, the first chapter, Paul talking to young minister Timothy about this oversight uh, role. He says, I, As I urged you upon my departure for Macedonia, remain on at Ephesus so that you may instruct certain men not to teach strange doctrines nor to pay attention to myths and endless genealogies which give rise to mere speculation rather than furthering the administration of God which is by faith. Now that word is translated many different ways uh, uh, in different uh, uh, in different versions of the Bible, but it's related to oversight or administration. It is a role of a pastor to establish those type of things. Uh, the, the original word in the Greek language is related to building a building. The person who is responsible for laying out the plans and making sure the building is built according to those plans. Now you know what the plans are, right? Uh, uh, Eugene reminded us of that earlier the objective of the church carry out the great commission great commandments of the Lord Jesus Christ the plan is laid out for us uh, that we are to be his feet his hands, his eyes, his voice in this world that, that the church not anything else not individuals it is the church on which Jesus will build his kingdom if you think you can do it without the church then you are disobeying God. Because some people think that, that just like Cain that I mentioned last week, that we will worship God as we say, as I want. And God says you will worship me as I say or you won't worship me at all. Because obedience is better than sacrifice. You can make all the sacrifices in the world that you want. But if you're not being obedient to serve through the living church of God, the bride of Christ, then you are doing nothing. And just like Cain, sin laid at his door ready to spring. And if you don't do right, as God said to Cain, it will overcome you, and it did. So... Administer the church. That's the role of the called minister of God as a pastor of a church. Even in English, the word means, ad means toward, right? Toward what? Toward ministry. You hear that? Now, ministry might be the ministry of a business or something like that, but the word itself means toward ministry. That the, there's a role of a pastor to set the organizational structure of a church so that it might accomplish what God said. And that's the role of the pastor and no one else. Now, it doesn't, doesn't mean that others don't help. 
doesn't mean that the wise pastor doesn't bring leadership in and, and try to organize this correctly, but he is the one that's going to have to give an answer. I'm the one that's going to have to stand before the Lord and give an answer for the organizational structure of Allen Baptist Church for the time I was here, not you. Aren't you glad? <laughs> so that's why I take it very seriously. Oversight is the one who's laying out the plans of constructing the ministry of the church. Of course, it's under the commands of the owner once again, right? He instructs that this oversight must be done in particular ways as instructed in his instruction book, the Word of God, and we must follow that. He says, though, as you're doing this administration, there are certain things to keep in mind that a pastor should keep in mind. First of all, it's not under compulsion. Not because you're forced to do it. Now, I, I heard these stories when I was young. You may have heard them too. Uh, you got the preacher who gets up in front of the congregation like this and said, I ran from the Lord for many years. He took my arm and so I surrendered to preach. <laughs> God doesn't want you to do it under compulsion. It's not, it's not, he's not going to take your eye out because you're not, you're not uh, preaching the gospel way he called you to do. You're either willing to do what he called you to do or not. You suffer your own consequences because of it. But don't blame God. He didn't take your arm. The thought here also in the original language is not a conscripted soldier. You all know, remember selective service? <laughs> Many of you do. Some of you experienced it probably, right? That's where the government had the right to call you up and you had to serve your two years in the army and if you didn't do it, you're going to Fort Leavenworth, right? And spend your time breaking rocks. Uh, selective service. The call to the ministry is not like selective service where somebody is making you do something. The whole story of the book of Jonah is it shouldn't be that way, right? It shouldn't be that you're forced to serve God. What should it be? It should be you do it voluntarily. This is the opposite of somebody who's conscripted to be a soldier and somebody who volunteers for the dangerous mission. We got a mission, it's very important, it needs to be done. You're the first one to step up and say, I'll do it, right? Voluntarily. Then he says also uh, that it should be enthusiastically. Uh, in uh, Matthew 5.41, whoever forces you to go one mile, go with him too. Now what's Jesus talking about? In that day and age, Palestine was occupied by the Romans. The law of the Roman Empire is anybody that's a citizen of the empire, they made everybody citizens of the empire. That's not the same as citizens of the city. They had more, more, uh, uh, more rights and privileges. But once they conquered you, they said, now you're part of the Roman Empire. That meant all the laws apply to you. One of the laws is a Roman soldier uh, going from assignment to assignment sometimes had to walk to the next assignment and so they, they, would, uh, uh, they could by law say, Jody, you carry my backpack, my, my load for a mile. And you're required by law to do it. That helped them get from assignment to assignment. And so they'd go a mile and then they'd find some other poor sucker to carry their, their, their stuff, right? But Jesus says, no, here's what I want you to do. In order to be a witness, in order to show uh, God's mercy and grace, when you get to the end of the mile, just tell them, I'll carry it another mile. Go the second mile, we call this, right? Because you see, our ministry should be voluntarily, not because somebody made us, but because we volunteer to do it. And it should be by the will of God. This reminds us that we do not administer oversight as pastors by our own will or with our own ideas. It is His will that we seek. This would also mean that we do not seek the will of the people. We are not political candidates. We are not looking for votes. We do what we do by God's will. If that's opposite of your idea, 
Sorry, I don't have to give an account to you. That sounds awful, doesn't it? We hired you. No, you didn't. It's called called. Called. That means you believe that I'm the person God is sending to do these things among you. That I'm called of God. God brought me. God will move me. Right? So you didn't hire me. As a matter of fact, the only reason you give me a salary is because the Bible teaches you that you are to take care of the gospel ministers while they're among you. Paul said you don't muzzle the ox, right? By the will of God. Not as man pleasers, but as God pleasers. That's our role. That's what God called me to when I was 12, and I've continued to this day following him not people. Not for sordid gain. What in the world does sordid mean? Well, the original word is a very, has a very deep meaning to it. It is that the only reason, the thought behind this word is the only reason you're doing what you're doing is for the money that you get out of it and you're greedy for the money. That's what that means. We should not be that way. Instead, he says, we do it with eagerness. We cannot wait to do it. We'll do it whether you got paid or not. I would. Whether I got paid or not. When Brenda and I started out, we made $125 a month. We lived off a lot of soup beans. And, and cornbread if we could afford it. Now you all take care of your pastor. You should be proud of that because that is a command of scripture to do so. And I thank you for that. But at the same time, I was making a whole lot more before I came here. Doc, you know that. But that's all right. This is where God sent me. That's not what it's about. And that's the way it ought to be. And you ought to expect that of your pastor. That it's not about sordid gain. He's eager. He wants to do it. Not lording it over. The pastor is to be a servant leader, right? Just as Jesus said we're supposed to. Uh, he said to his disciples, calling them to himself, Jesus said to them, You know that those who are recognized as rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them. And their great men exercise authority over them. But it is not this way among you. But whoever wishes to become great among you shall be your servant. And whoever wishes to be first among you shall be a slave of all. For even the Son of Man did not come to be saved, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. I don't mean to say this to brag. That would be, I only brag in Jesus. There's nothing good in me. I just want to give you an illustration. During this COVID time, when it would have been easy for a pastor to just sit back and do nothing. I want you to know, and the staff is my witness, I've worked even harder during this time. Why? Because it's not about what I can get by with. It's that I am serving the church of God, serving God, and I have to give an account to Him. So I don't lay down any day. Not one day. Not even Saturday because Brenda makes sure I have chores to do. And that's the way it ought to be. Work, for the night is coming when no man can work. Work. He who does not work should not also eat, the Bible says. Because work is important. Why? Work gives you self-worth. Work gives you something you can lay before the Lord and say, I've served you today. Work. He says, be examples. Tupos is the word, uh, we're used to the word type. And a type uh, of something that strikes the word was used like a notary seal here. It strikes the surface and imprints something on it. 
a, a, a figure struck by something. When we're examples of the image of Christ, we try as best as possible as pastors to take the image of Christ and stamp it upon ourselves so that we might be an example. Not perfect. The Apostle Paul said, that which I want to do, I don't do. That which I don't want to do is what I do, O oh, wretched man that I am. But he still said, I press on to the high calling of the Lord Jesus Christ. And he did say, follow my example as I did so. Imperfect people, but a perfect Savior. And we try to have him implanted on our soul so that we might be a type of him so that you might see Christ in us. And you should do the same. That's not just for pastors. And then he said, work for the chief shepherd. Verse 4, and when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the unfading crown of glory. Let me tell you something. Faithful ministers are going to be honored by the Lord. I don't say this because I deserve it. I just say this to claim the promise. But that glory is not for us only, but for all who love the appearing, right? When we stand before Christ, we will have to give an account, not about our ideas or the ideas of people of the church, but how well we have carried out His commands. That's the only thing we'll have to give an account for, not anything that some disgruntled church member might want to put before the Lord. Jesus is my lawyer. I think He can take care of that. Hebrews 13, 17, Obey your leaders and submit to them. For they keep watch over your souls as those who will give an account. Let them do this with joy and not with grief, for this would be unprofitable for you. There's a little bit of warning there, right? That those who attack the ministers of God and give them grief when they're trying to watch over your soul, it's not going to be profitable before you because God's not going to like it very much. He says, work with other pastors. You younger men, he says, he's still talking to ministers. You younger ministers, likewise be subject to your elders. Clothe yourself in humility and those type of things. What he's saying is pastors are not lone rangers. You shouldn't expect them to be. They support and help one another. This is another reason why we're cooperative Southern Baptists so that we might help and support each other. Pastors of Enterprise Association, pastors of the state of Kentucky. This is why I serve as I do for the Kentucky Baptist Convention as their parliamentarian and before that the president because I think it's my duty to serve the other pastors and churches. I take these teachings very seriously. I hope you've picked up on that. I attempt to follow them along with all the other scriptural teachings found in the word of God concerning ministers of the gospel. Well, this has not been a, that evangelistic of a sermon. I, I, I think you probably picked up on that, right? But we teach the whole word of God. And we go through every verse because all are inspired. But during this time of difficulty when you might be wondering what in the world is happening in this world as Jody and the guys come, I want to remind you of something. I want to remind you that there is only one answer. There's only one answer with the troubles in the Middle East and the attacks upon Israel. There's only one answer to, to all the problems in the United States. There's only one answer to all the gasoline stuff and yeah, I'm talking about every. There's only one answer to everything, every question in the world, and that answer is Jesus, the Messiah, the Christ. Because you see, all things are in his hands, and all things will be made right at the day of his coming. Do you believe that? So when you ask, what in the world? What, what is this world coming to? It's coming to Christ because it belongs to Him. And He will set all things straight. You see, when you give your heart and life to Jesus, we're no longer slaves. Slaves to sin. Slaves to situations. Slaves to what other people do. We're set free 
in Christ Jesus. Will you stand as Jody leads us in singing, No Longer Slaves. You unravel me with a melody. You surround me with a song of deliverance from my enemies till all my fears are gone. I'm no longer a slave to fear. I am a child of God. I'm no
Child of God. 